Chapter 31 The Masonic Stairway and Other Symbols On our way to the Sanctum Sanctorum, the newly made Messon undertakes a passage through what is commonly called the Middle Chamber. The reference into the Middle Way is through the Temple of Solomon, and the pathway to the Holy of Holies, the Adidim in which the Holy Ark of the Covenant resides at the Kaddish Hakadashim, or the place in which Deity dwells. In that journey through the Middle Space, the Second Degree Brother is introduced to some of the more seemingly secular-influenced aspects of the fraternity that begin to take on a double, or symbolic, meaning on their surface. The basic notions of these things are obvious, but not until you start to look at them closely, at their deeper meanings, that we start to see their relationships to other more esoteric ideas. This is similar to religious traditions where within one religious text there can be multiple layers of meaning, and multiple ways of interpretation which can lead to an allegorical, a moral, or a mystical meaning. Indeed, as the degree is symbolically in King Solomon's temple, so too can it be seen as a symbolic metaphor to our own internal path, what Joseph Campbell calls the hero quest, and where you leave the world that you are in and go into a depth or into a distance or up to a height. This is not to assume that the Masonic degrees have a similar relevancy to sacred or spiritual texts, though some could argue that their significance is almost as powerful to some observance. It is a system of morality that strives to make good men better which runs nearly in parallel with the many volumes of the sacred law which seeks similar outcomes to achieve as it outlines and instructs its path to elevation. Whether it's salvation or spiritual awakening the holy books seek to instruct its adherents to live better lives through their faith, the same that Freemasonry strives to through its practice, to make those good men better. In that process of making the good man a candidate for the degrees is made an entered apprentice, symbolically as he ascends Jacob's ladder. Once at the top, he is presented a series of three groups of symbols which are set before him to become a second degree messen so as they may observe and contemplate them in their path of progression, their hero's quest, to the third degree. The story of the degree, from Duncan's Masonic Ritual and Monitor, picks up after the passage between the twin pillars of the degree with the conductor delivering this instruction, Brother, we will pursue our journey. The next thing that attracts our attention is the winding stairs which lead to the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple, consisting of three, five, and seven steps. The first three allude to the three principal stages of human life, namely, youth, manhood, and old age. In youth, as entered apprentices, we ought industriously to occupy our minds in the attainment of useful knowledge. In manhood, as fellow crafts, we should apply our knowledge to the discharge of our respective duties to God, our neighbors, and ourselves. So that in old age, as master messons, we may enjoy the happy reflections consequent on a well-spent life, and die in the hope of a glorious immortality. They also allude to the three principal supports in masonry, namely, wisdom, strength and beauty. For it is necessary that there should be wisdom to contrive, strength to support, and beauty to adorn all great and important undertakings. They further allude to the three principal officers of the lodge, viz. master and senior and junior wardens. Let's pause here and consider what some of the deeper meanings of these first steps infer. The first segment is fairly straightforward, with narrative telling us that the three steps allude to the three stages of human life, youth, manhood, and old age. Youth is defined as young persons, collectively. A young person, especially a young man. The quality or state of being young. Youthfulness. Juvenility, the part of life that succeeds to childhood. The period of existence preceding maturity or age. The whole early part of life, from childhood, or, sometimes, from infancy, to manhood. This is a pretty straightforward idea, especially as it says to us that we ought industriously to occupy our minds in the attainment of useful knowledge, but how does this apply to an older initiate? Someone who is no longer in his youth. Is it a wistful thought to what was achieved when younger and then still in school? Taken on a deeper level, it could allude to the idea of the degree itself, the first degree being synonymous to mean that on the first, the candidate comes to the lodge as a youth, despite his chronological or physical age, with a clean slate of perception and a clean palette of interpretation. In a sense, he comes as blank slate to its teachings or to the ideas before him. The degree being his introduction from exterior life to interior life which ushers him both into the fraternity and into the concept of the undertaking. Pike, in the first degree lecture in Morals and Dogma, calls this the focusing of the aspirant's unregulated force, 
the channel by which they constrain their previously raw, infantile state, into that of a focused and youthful aspirant no matter their age. Next, the candidate enters into his manhood, more literally the second degree, of which the ceremony says of it we should apply our knowledge to the discharge of our respective duties to God, our neighbors, and ourselves which is a really active process to live by. We, in essence, are to achieve much by way of our doing, essentially, the work of our daily life towards our deity in worship and practice, our community in which we live and reside, but more specifically as we apply it to ourselves and continuing to apply what we've learned in our youth to the state of existence. The Free Dictionary defines manhood as 1. The state or time of being an adult male human. 2. The composite of qualities, such as courage, determination, and vigor, often thought to be appropriate to a man. 3. Adult males considered as a group. Men. 4. The state of being human. In the third entry, we can take much from it beyond it simply being our middle state of being. It is in fact our ability to be in the first place, our self and daily practice. Interesting as this is, the second degree in which our further education takes place is not only about the practice of our youth but also our ability to learn and apply that education to our life. Campbell says of the age progression that as a child, you are brought up in a world of discipline, of obedience and you are dependent on others. All this has to be transcended when you come to maturity, so that you can live not in dependency but with self-responsible authority. 2. This is, in essence, the heart of the three-degree progression and the fundamental of the three steps, he becoming a man, or woman, respecting your discipline. Old age is a bit more of a troubling and complex issue. So often in modern society we look at old age as a point of retirement where work and physical activity dramatically changes or diminishes. In this description, the idea of old age holds true in that the degree says of old age that in it we may enjoy the happy reflections consequent on a well-spent life, and die in the hope of a glorious immortality. There are several interesting meanings we can take from this especially that it is in the degrees that these physical changes are metaphorically said to take place which can become a literal interpretation, and that once attained the master messin can live through them, literally to reflect on the life well spent. What's troubling here is that the major portion of the work of the lodge is spent in the third degree and a caution must be considered so as to not see the work of the master mason as just one of reflection and of casual rest less no work, as described in manhood be completed. Old age is essentially defined as one's age nearing or passing the average lifespan of human beings, and thus at the end of the human life cycle in the U.S. This is considered to be 78 years old giving a distinct impression as to when one should then become a true master. It really is at a twilight of life period, one of great age and maturity where little change and much reflection takes place. This gives us an interesting perspective on the meaning as it implies a near end of physical life period of time which squares with a degrees lesson as the period of reflection of a life well spent. We become the master of our all, ready to pass our knowledge unto the next generation. With this vantage, we can take pause to deeply consider that our daily working of the degrees, intrinsically, could, or should, be conducted in the second state, our manhood in which we conversely learn and grow. Symbolism of the second degree. Serlet, in his Dictionary of Symbols, makes an interesting point in that the idea of progression in the stages of age is not unique to masonry. Besides the stages themselves, the number three, three, is a representation of synthesis and unites the solution of conflict posed by dualism. In other words, the third object brings about balance for the first two opposing states. Think of the balance of three dots, one stacked above two. From this point, the degree breaks off to correlate these first steps with the three principal pillars of the lodge as wisdom, strength and beauty which also has an interesting cabalistic point of reference in the three pillars that make up the structure of the tree of life. Keep in mind, the orientation assumes the viewer reverse the structure to mirror one's own standing rather than simply reflect the observer. Wisdom, the left-hand pillar of mercy, is an active pillar and representative of alchemical fire which is the principle of spirituality, often called the pillar of Jackin. It is a masculine pillar, and relates to our mental energy, our loving kindness, and our creative inspiration as we traverse it up the Kabbalistic tree through the Sephirot. Strength is the right-hand pillar and takes the form of severity, shaped into the alchemical symbol of water. It can represent darkness, but it is a passive symbol that is feminine in nature and called the pillar of Boaz. Upon it we find the points of our thoughts and ideas, our feelings and emotions, and the physicality of our physical experience.
our sensations, each an aspect of its Kabbalistic progression. Beauty, then, takes on the role of synthesis of the two, the pillar of mildness. It is upon this pillar that the novitiate is transformed through his progressive states as he progresses. The central pillar of beauty is representative of Jehovah, the tetragrammaton which represents deity itself upon which our crown of being resides balanced through feeling and emotion from our foundation of justice and mercy, all of which springs from our link to the everyday world. These aspects of the Kabbalah are not specific attributes of the study in the Blue Lodge, rather elements of deeper esoteric study found more specifically in the degrees of the Scottish Rite. Because of the pillars, and their deeper symbolic meaning, it does, however, necessitate looking at them deeper to see the relationship between them as the Blue Lodge degrees seem to have parallels in the study of the Kabbalah, a happy accident at some time past or with purpose to link the ideas together. Wisdom, strength, and beauty are specific aspects of the lower three degrees and emphasized here in the first three steps into the middle chamber, necessitating their deeper esoteric study to fully grasp their broader importance. As the degree instructs, wisdom is to contrive, strength is to support, and beauty is to adorn all great and important undertakings, which are the fundamentals of the three pillars in the Kabbalistic study. Conversely, as the degree states, these three pillars allude to the three principal officers of the lodge, viz. master, and senior and junior wardens, and can be interpreted as such in both the micro, in lodge, fashion and in a broader macro tradition of masonry itself, in this Kabbalistic formulation. When the alchemical aspects of wisdom and strength are combined we can see the six-pointed star appears, the symbol of transformation, often depicted in the conjoining of the square and compass in which messons are instructed to square their actions and circumscribe their passions, which also corresponds to the link between the Saints John's, the Baptist as the principle of alchemical water, and the evangelist as the symbol of alchemical fire, both of whom have much deeper esoteric connections in masonry. Also, the figures of the lodge leadership have a deeper connection as you begin to look at their alchemical connections too, when you look at their relationship to the sun and moon, and the aspirant candidate is the solution of conflict, as Erlit described, and as defined in the first degree, the three-sphere aspect to balance the two of conflict. From these short first few tentative steps, we can see that there is a wealth of Masonic symbols at hand, but we are only one-third into our progression. Our next step takes us deeper into the middle chamber to its central position where we encounter an interesting juxtaposition of the physical world to our very human aspect of being through our senses. For now, reflect a time on these first three steps and consider what comes next upon the path. Five Steps Upon the Winding Staircase The second degree lecture holds a wealth of esoteric study and contemplation. In the preceding examination we looked at the depth and meaning of the first three steps as the conductor in Duncan's ritual and monitor ushers the candidate into the allegorical chamber of King Solomon's temple. Now, the candidate is faced with a further rise of steps, five to be exact which is described in this text taken directly from Duncan's Ritual and Monitor of Freemasonry. Stepping forward to the five steps, he continues, the five steps allude to the five orders of architecture and the five human senses. The five orders of architecture are Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and Composite. For any brother reading, it's important to take a moment to look anew at your monitor, if supplied with one, to reacquaint the reference as it relates specifically to masonry. From an exoteric point of view, we must look to the point of origin to the orders of architecture, which turns our attention to the grandfather of modern architecture, Vitruvius. Marcus Vitruvius Pollio. Vitruvius, born c. 80-70 BC, died after c. 15 BC, is described on Wikipedia as having been a Roman writer, architect and engineer possibly Prophectus Fabrum, the man in charge, during military service or Prophect Architectus Armamentarius, the man in charge of architecture, of the apparitor status group, active in the 1st century BC. By his own description Vitruvius served as a ballista, artilleryman, the third class of arms in the military offices. He likely served as chief of the ballista, senior officer of artillery, in charge of doctors ballistarum, artillery experts, and librators who actually operated the machines. The Vitruvian man, as illustrated by da Vinci, was based on Vitruvius proportions from his writings. Those writings can be found in his collected works, commonly called the Architectural Library de Sem or Vitruvius, the ten books on architecture. In the work, 
Vitruvius describes an assortment of things from town planning to aqueducts. The rediscovery of his work in the Renaissance had a profound influence on architects of the age which started the rise of the neoclassical style. Period architects, such as Niccoli, Brunelleschi and Leon Battista Alberti, found in the architecture reason for raising their branch of knowledge to a scientific discipline as well as emphasizing the skills of the artisan. Further the English architect Inigo Jones, who crafted the Queen's House at Greenwich in 1616 and the Banqueting House at Whitehall in 1619, and the French hydraulic engineer Salomon de Caus who designed the gardens at Somerset House and the Hortus Palatinus in Heidelberg, Germany, known for its then wonders of a statue that resounded when struck by the rays of the sun, a water organ, and singing fountains and were among the first to rethink and implement the disciplines of Vitruvius which were considered a necessary element of architecture, essentially art and science based upon number and proportion, which was reinvigorating to architecture of the period. The 16th century architect Andrea Palladio who designed a number of villas, palaces, and churches in and around Venice, considered Vitruvius his master and guide and made drawings based on Vitruvius' work before evolving his own architectural precepts. Inigo Jones, for those who are unfamiliar, is also the author of a manuscript circa 1607, on the origin of masonry, amongst other things. Lomas, in Freemasonry and the Birth of Modern Science, dates the time of Jones' Freemasonry as 1607, while he was a surveyor to the crown under James VI. The idea of divine architecture came directly from Vitruvius's work as divine proportions were very much a consideration in every design. In his book of architecture, in book 4 the middle three pillars, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, are described and by their physical traits for use in the temples of their celestial counterparts. On finding that, in a man, the foot was one-sixth of the height, they applied the same principle to the column, and reared the shaft, including the capital, to a height six times its thickness at the base. Thus the door column, as used in buildings, begin to exhibit the proportion, strength, and beauty of a man. Just so afterwards, when they desired to construct a temple to Diana in a new style of beauty ionic, they translated these footprints into terms characteristic of the slenderness of women, and thus first made a column the thickness of which was only one-eighth of its height, so that it might have a taller look at the foot they substituted the base in place of a shoe. In the capital they placed the volutes, hanging down at the right and left like curly ringlets, and ornamented its front with cimatia and wide festoons of fruit arranged in place of hair, while they brought the flutes down the whole shaft, falling like the folds in the robes worn by matrons. Thus in the invention of the two different kinds of columns, they borrowed manly beauty, naked and unadorned, for the one, and for the other the delicacy, adornment and proportions characteristic of women. The third order, called Corinthian, is an imitation of the slenderness of a maiden. For the outlines and limbs of maidens, being more slender on account of their tender years, admit a prettier effects in the way of adornment. The story of the Corinthian column goes on to tell of its inspiration which was from the growth of an acanthus through the basket of a young Corinth maiden's possessions atop her tomb. The Athenian artist Callimachus passed it and took delight at its novel style and built columns after its form. Once he determined the dimensions and proportions it was established to the rule for the Corinthian order, thus setting, literally, into stone the symmetry of beauty. In another instance in Vitruvius's work he details the facing of temples so as they can be experienced in a manner in line with many of the great esoteric and religious traditions. He oriented them to be entered from the west to enable those who approached the altar with offerings or sacrifices to face the direction of the sunrise in facing the statue in the temple, and thus those who are undertaking vows look toward the quarter from which the sun comes forth and likewise the statues themselves appear to be coming forth out of the east to look upon them as they pray and sacrifice. Book 4, ch. 5, this certainly does not predate the idea of Solomon's temple orientation, but it's questionable if perhaps Vitruvius was influenced in any way by this Judaic Old Testament writing, or operating on an older principle of temple building. In its simplest of thought, the older idea of knowledge, better thought of as wisdom came from the east in the rising sun as it has symbolically represented the idea of a daily new beginning. The word used for one who undertakes the degrees in masonry, uninitiate, comes from the Latin initiare which means to begin anew. It would, no doubt, mesh with Renaissance architects as designers would see the parallels between the Old Testament temple and the classical temple styling to follow that same pattern.
1. From an esoteric standpoint, we can start to infer much of how this translates to our work as a Freemason, building that unseen house. But this also has a practical application that would have been at the very forefront of our early forebearers' thought, as with Inigo Jones, as they planned and built the neoclassical temples of the late Renaissance. Perhaps in some ways this is a vestige to our very being a Freemason, homage to the ancient practicing of our brothers in antiquity and a means to making being a mason relevant to the teachings. But as the degree then turns from the idea of architecture so must we to the aspect of our human senses, five in total, and their specific link to our ability to hear, see, and feel. The degree says, the five human senses are hearing, seeing, feeling, smelling, and tasting, the first three of which have ever been highly esteemed among masons, hearing, to hear the word seeing, to see the sign, feeling, to feel the grip, whereby one mason may know another in the dark as well as in the light. Again, as the orders of architecture are of a specific physicality, so too is this treatise on the five senses of the physicality of man. It speaks much to our physically interpreting the activity around us. In many ways it is reminiscent of the motto ad, vide, taste which from the Latin translates to say no, dare. Be silent which goes further to suggest of the same three tactile senses said to be of greatest importance that they have a parallel union, hearing, knowing equals to learn and understand what is being taught, seeing, daring equals to think on and consider its purpose and meaning, feeling, touching equals to be silent rather than attempting to stumble until fuller knowledge is attained. The longer Roman proverb reads, Audi, vide, tace, see to vis vivere which means to hear, see, be silent, if you wish to live, in peace, which can give us a cryptic undertone or a view to see the disharmony of not being silent. This middle chamber, middle position, examination gives us much to reflect on especially as it relates to our physicality and the role of a fellow of the craft, but to get a broader feel we need to look more widely at the implications of the period understanding to what these five senses represented. Cornelius Agrippa, in his three books of occult philosophy, says of the five senses, there be five senses in man, sight, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, five powers in the soul, five fingers of the hand, five wandering planets in the heavens. It is also called the number of the cross, yea eminent with the principal wounds of Christ too, whereof he vouchsafed to keep the scars in his glorified body. The heathen philosophers did dedicate it as sacred to Mercury, esteeming the virtue of it to be so much more excellent than the number four by how much a living thing is more excellent than a thing without life. Hence in time of grace the name of divine omnipotence is called upon with five letters the ineffable name of God was expressed with five letters Jesu. The five wounds of original sin, first, death to the soul, heart, second, darkness in the intellect, the right hand, third, malice, an inclination to evil, the left hand, fourth, sensuality, disordered desires, the left foot, and fifth, irritability and aggression, the right foot. Iheso is the Middle Ages usage of the name of Jesus, often written in Catholicism as simply IHS which has run through both Greek and Latin translations. In Greek, it looks like Iota Eta Sigma Omicron Upsilon Sigma which becomes Asus in English. The H comes from the variants of Eta which is Epsilon, and rendered as H giving us Agrippa's meaning. Further in the work of Agrippa, he attributes the number 5 beyond the senses touching on the planets, the animal kingdom and five things as made by God, essence, the same, similarity, another, difference, sense, and motion. He called the number five the Pythagorean number of wedlock and justice, such we could interpret as Solomonic justice, because the number divides ten on an even scale, five represents the point of balance. Clearly, we can see that Agrippa found some greater importance in the five senses broadening their occult interpretations. What we can take from this is that the five senses can be as limited as we choose to see them or as broad as we can start to interpret them to be as most interpretations of the number five have similar or like meaning. In either case, they have a wide variance by which to perceive them than simply in the five points of perfection. In these two discussions of physicality, architecture and sense, we find two seemingly unrelated elements that on the second degree are intricately interwoven and presented by instruction as integral to the metaphorical building of Solomon's temple, or more specifically, our own temple of inner being. Like the great Greek and Roman pillars our senses are ever increasing importance giving our physicality a dimension to the degree. Yet, by digging deeper, through some of the more esoteric connections, 
we can get a sense of the power of this simple number that divides 10, a Solomink number, the number of perfection. So here, we have reached our second landing upon the staircase. We have surmounted our second series of steps in the middle chamber and come to a point of rest. Before us is the next ascent which will take us up a dizzying flight of seven steps. Though the number may seem small, its connections are many and varied and further round out the active role of our manhood which is our place of being as a fellow of the craft. Behind us rests the previous three and five steps, a monumental feat of climbing indeed, but before we can claim our victory over them, we must surmount the next seven and explore their potentiality and meaning. The middle chamber. From the three steps to the five steps, we now stand at the landing of the middle chamber. On this journey we have climbed much, traversing up Jacob's ladder in the first degree, climbed the first series of three steps and introduced to their significance in our maturity with an introduction to the Kabbalah. Then, we traversed upon the next five steps where we were illustrated the role of architecture and to our senses to take in the exoteric and esoteric undertaking of the degree. Now, before us we confront the next leg, the next seven steps that have such meaning that they can scarcely be fully understood as they are contained in their presentation. To approach them, we must first see them as presented in context through Duncan's ritual and monitor of Freemasonry as he writes of the journey. The seven steps allude to the seven sabbatical years, seven years of famine, seven years in building the temple, seven golden candlesticks, seven wonders of the world, seven wise men of the East, seven planets. But, more especially, the seven liberal arts and sciences, which are, grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, each of these arts, as they are defined come with a specific exoteric meaning. They are what they presume to be, and by that I mean that they are in fact what we consider comparable to be the liberal arts of study in university today. At first blush, seven dissonant elements are mentioned first, but our concentration must first come to focus on the latter seven, the seven liberal arts and sciences. But why study a liberal arts course of study? Harvard, a school of some esteem and founded well before masonry organized under its present-day Grand Lodge system, says of a present-day liberal arts education that a liberal education is a preparation for the rest of life. It goes on to say a liberal education is an education conducted in a spirit of free inquiry undertaken without concern for topical relevance or vocational utility. This kind of learning is not only one of the enrichments of existence. It is one of the achievements of civilization. It heightens students' awareness of the human and natural worlds they inhabit. It makes them more reflective about their beliefs and choices, more self-conscious and critical of their presuppositions and motivations, more creative in their problem-solving, more perceptive of the world around them, and more able to inform themselves about the issues that arise in their lives, personally, professionally, and socially, college is an opportunity to learn and reflect in an environment free from most of the constraints on time and energy that operate in the rest of life. Though the idea of what a liberal study was at the time of their inclusion in masonry, the principle of that study was the same. This is no subtle assertion. The creators of the Masonic degrees agreed and included in them the instruction to pursue the study of this program to better make the Mason, in short, to make the man a better man with a firm understanding of the liberal arts is a necessary foundation for his being. But what exactly does that mean? To see that answer, we must look at what resides within the study of the liberal arts as instructed by Duncan's monitor. To do that, we need to break down what the study of the liberal arts would entail in its age of inclusion. Grammar The body of rules describing the properties of the English language. A language is such that its elements must be combined according to certain patterns. Its morphology the building blocks of language, and syntax, the construction of meaningful phrases, clauses and sentences with the use of morphemes and words. The first codex for English grammar, concisely called pamphlet for grammar was compiled written by William Bullockar, and was written with the ostensible goal of demonstrating that English was just as worthy and rule-bound as was Latin and was published in 1586. Bullockar's grammar was faithfully modeled on William Lilly's Latin grammar, Rudimenta Grammaticis, 1534, which was a Latin text and was used in schools in England at that time, as it was prescribed for them in 1542 by Henry VIII. From early on we can see that the use of language was seen as an important necessity and that the study of grammar and the use of language in communication of ideas to others as an important aspect of transferring knowledge. Rhetoric. Like grammar, 
is the art of using language to communicate effectively and persuasively involving three audience appeals, logos which is the reason or the rational principle expressed in words and things one, pathos which is the, the quality or power, asp in literature or speech, of arousing feelings of pity, sorrow two, and ethos which is the, the distinctive character, spirit, and attitudes of a people, culture, era, three, as well as the five canons of rhetoric, invention or discovery, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery along with grammar and logic or dialectic, rhetoric is one of the three ancient arts of discourse dating back to antiquity and the great works of Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle of whose surviving texts we can read today. From ancient Greece to the late 19th century, rhetoric was a central part of Western education, filling the need to train public speakers and writers to move audiences to action with arguments rather than coercion of force. It is the use of language in persuasion of others, an interesting Masonic application, indeed. Logic, with its origins from the Greek, logike, is the study of arguments, grammar and rhetoric together. Logic is used in most intellectual activities, but is studied primarily in the disciplines of philosophy, mathematics, and computer science. Logic examines general forms which arguments may take comparing which forms are valid, and which are fallacies. It is a form of critical thinking. In philosophy, the study of logic figures into most major areas of focus, epistemology, ethics, and metaphysics. In mathematics, it takes place in the study of valid inferences within some formal language. Clearly, we can see that logis is the application of grammar and rhetoric together. These three areas of study composed what the medieval universities called the tritium, meaning the three roads or three ways which was necessary in preparation for the quadrivium which are the next four liberal arts of ancient study. The use and preparation of this work was principally for the deeper study of philosophy and theology both noble arts in this period of the Middle Ages and Renaissance. The four studies came from the curriculum as outlined by Plato in the Republic as written in the seventh book. The same quadrivium was suggested to have come from the Pythagoreans, as Proclus wrote in a commentary on the first book of Euclid's Elements, the Pythagoreans considered all mathematical science to be divided into four parts, one half they marked off as concerned with quantity, the other half with magnitude, and each of these they posited as twofold. A quantity can be considered in regard to its character by itself or in its relation to another quantity, magnitudes as either stationary or in motion. Arithmetic, then, studies quantities as such, music the relations between quantities, geometry magnitude at rest, spherics astronomy magnitude inherently moving. Arithmetic. Arithmetic, then, is the simple day-to-day -day counting to advanced science and business calculations involving the study of quantity, especially as the result of combining numbers. In day-to-day -day usage it refers to the simple properties of traditional operations such as addition, subtraction, multiplication and division with small number values. The origins of arithmetic are thought to date back to as early as 20,000 BCE. From ancient tally marks on bone, however earliest records date back to the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians of 2000 BCE. With numeral systems and counting marks, continuous historical development of modern arithmetic begins in the Hellenistic period of Greece with a close relationship to philosophical and mystical beliefs such as in the works of Euclid and Pythagoras, both Masonic patriarchs. Geometry From the Greek as earth measurement, geometry is concerned with the determination of shape, size, relative position of figures, and the properties of space. Euclid, Archimedes, Descartes, Kepler and Pythagoras are but a few who are a part of this 5,000-year-old art of lengths, angles, area, and volume, of which works can be found in ancient Egypt and Babylon too. A fantastic example of their prowess we look to still today in the Great Pyramids of Giza. The advanced study of geometry today looks not just into the dimension and space of number, but into its correlation to physics, algebra, and string theory just to name a few as it puts to measure both the physical and invisible universe. Music The art of the muses is an art form whose medium is found in the creation of sound. Common elements of music are to be found in pitch, which governs melody and harmony, rhythm, and its associated concepts of tempo, meter, and articulation, dynamics, and the sonic qualities of timbre and texture. More than the study of melody and song, the Pythagoreans of ancient Greece were the first researchers believed to have investigated the expression of music in scale in terms of numerical ratios, 
particularly the ratios of small integers. Their central doctrine was that all nature consists of harmony arising out of number 4. On Pythagorean scale, the Greek Pythagorean and Presocratic philosopher, Philolaus says in Carl Huffman's Philolaus, a musical scale presupposes an unlimited continuum of pitches, which must be limited in some way in order for a scale to arise. The crucial point is that not just any set of limiters will do. We cannot just pick pitches at random along the continuum and produce a scale that will be musically pleasing. The scale that Philolaus adopts is such that the ratio of the highest to the lowest pitch is to 1 which produces the interval of an octave. That octave is in turn divided into a fifth and a fourth, which have the ratios of 3, 2 and 4, 3 respectively and which, when added, make an octave. If we go up a fifth from the lowest note in the octave and then up a fourth from there, we will reach the upper note of the octave. Finally the fifth can be divided into three whole tones, each corresponding to the ratio of 9, 8 and a remainder with a ratio of 256, 243 and the fourth into two whole tones with the same remainder. Thus, in Philolaw's system the fitting together of limiters and unlimiteds involves their combination in accordance with ratios of numbers. Similarly the cosmos and the individual things in the cosmos do not arise by a chance combination of limiters and unlimiteds. The limiters and unlimiteds must be fitted together in a pleasing way in accordance with number for in order to arise. Fragment 6 suggests that Philolaus saw the cosmos as put together according to the diatonic scale. This would be very much in accord with the famous conception of the harmony of the spheres according to which the heavenly bodies make harmonious music as they move. But neither in Philolaus nor any other early source do we get an explicit account of how the musical scale corresponds to the astronomical system. Five. As you can see, the study of music, in its basic form of composition and in its deeper esoteric study, lends itself to the exploration of mathematics, logic, and geometry, which can lead to a better understanding of the universe itself, which brings us to the last element in this progression. Astronomy. More precisely called astrology in its earliest Western study. Astrology and astronomy were archaically one and the same discipline, Latin, astrologia, and were only gradually recognized as separate in Western 17th century philosophy during the Age of Reason. Since that time the two have come to be regarded as completely separate disciplines. Astronomy, then, is the study of objects and phenomena from beyond the Earth's atmosphere which is a science and widely studied in academic discipline discovering the expanse of the heavens in planets, stars, and other stellar phenomena. Astrology, which uses the positions of celestial objects as the foundation for predictions of future events, and other esoteric knowledge, which is not considered a science and is often seen as a form of divination. The early astronomer-astrologer, despite its predictive application, would use the study of celestial bodies and chart the astrological movements in space which in turn were applied to correspondences in day-to-day -day life of those who he charted them for. Many Renaissance scientists were astronomer-astrologers including Isaac Newton, Galileo Galilei, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, the infamous John D. Astrologer and Magus for the court of Elizabeth I in 1558. It's suggested that by his charts he selected Elizabeth's coronation date. The practice was in keeping with their earlier study pattern of the liberal arts and not seen as abhorrent to their conclusions in their time. Scoffed at in academic circles today, the realm of astrology is often the fodder for cheap periodicals and psychic infomercials. In its deeper recesses we can link it to the study of the Kabbalah and the Western mystery traditions and find parallels to our perceptions and ideas even in our Masonic symbolism. Just a quick look at the Holy Saints John again will remind us of our own pairing of earth-bound ideas to the equatorial poles of our sun's annual transition from summer to winter and back again. Perhaps this is coincidence, or by design. In either case it gives us a link to our past in the liberal studies. This is, in some aspect of antiquity, the role of astrology and the cycle of mankind and our understanding of it. Notwithstanding the work in Duncan's or in more localized versions of the work, the number seven has a deep and rich symbolic significance within many circles. Serlet, in his A Dictionary of Symbols says of the number seven that it is symbolic of perfect order, a complete period or cycle composed of the ternary and quaternary and endowed with exceptional value. He goes on to suggest that it corresponds to the seven directions of space and to the reconciliation of the square with the triangle, the sky over the earth. Seven is the number expressing the sum of heaven and earth. Six. Now, 
as we have looked at the seven liberal arts it is necessary to turn back to the dissonant collection at the beginning of this section of steps to look at some of the other connections mentioned in Duncan's ritual monitor to bring them into resonance. In this degree, Duncan mentions the seven sabbatical years, seven years of famine, seven years in building the temple, seven golden candlesticks, seven wonders of the world, seven wise men of the east and seven planets. Briefly we must touch on what each of those things mentioned in the sevens allude to and see if we can find any deeper esoteric meaning behind them to get a glimpse of their significance or meaning to masonry. The number seven. The seven sabbatical years, known also as Shemitah, is the seventh year of a seven-year agricultural cycle as mandated by the Torah for the use of the land of Israel. During that seventh year the land is to lay fallow and all agricultural activity on its stops, excluding some maintenance and comes from the book of Leviticus which makes promise of bountiful harvest to those who are observant, Leviticus 25 20-22 NIV. 20 You may ask, what will we eat in the seventh year if we do not plant or harvest our crops? 21 I will send you such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three years. 22 While you plant during the eighth year, you will eat from the old crop and will continue to eat from it until the harvest of the ninth year comes in. The seven years of famine stems literally from Genesis 41:30, which reads and there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine shall consume the land which follows a seven year period of great abundance. Interestingly, there are other activities in the period of the sabbatical year, in which debts are to be forgiven as it is considered a godly act which becomes a component of the focus in that seventh year. The seven years in building the temple is clearly the story of Solomon building the temple in which King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel, and the labor force was 30,000 men. Solomon selected 70,000 men to bear burdens, 80,000 to quarry stone in the mountains, and 3,600 to oversee them. 1 Kings 5 13 2 Chronicles 2 2 According to 1 Kings 6 38 the work of the temple took seven years saying, and in the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its parts, and according to all its specifications he was seven years in building it. The seven golden candlesticks, literally from Revelations 1 20, NIV, which reads, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This could, interpretively, be seen as the menorah which is a seven-branched candelabrum used in the ancient tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness not to be confused with the nine-branched menorah used at Hanukkah. The great architect himself instructing Moses on the construction of the lamp in Exodus 25 31-40 a depiction of which can be found on the Arch of Titus which is a 1st century Roman honorific on the Via Sacra in Rome which shows the spoils from the sack of Jerusalem. The menorah, when lit, was said to represent the Shekinah, which refers to a dwelling or settling in a special sense as that of divine presence, to the effect that, while in proximity to the Shekinah, the connection to God is more readily perceivable. Its lighting, or continual ignition, is variously representative of universal enlightenment and or the burning bush as seen by Moses. The temple menorah is a more likely source of Masonic inspiration as it fits with the appointments of King Solomon's temple, to whom masonry holds its affinity and whose role fits more in resonance with the purpose of the degrees. The seven wonders of the world are very straightforward and are reflections on the impressive work of the masons, literally stone cutters, who came before the present day lodge. The ancient wonders were, the Great Pyramid of Giza from 2584-2561 BC in Egypt. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon from around 600 BC in Iraq. The Statue of Zeus at Olympia from 466-456 BC, Temple, 435 BC, Statue, in Greece. The Temple of Artemis at Ephesus circa 550 BC in Turkey. The Mausoleum of Halicarnassus 351 BC to which the modern AASRSJ headquarters is modeled after, in Carians, Persians, Greeks, the Colossus of Rhodes from 292-280 BC in Greece, the Lighthouse of Alexandria circa 280 BC in Hellenistic Egypt, Greece. The seven wise men of the East were early 6th century BC philosophers, statesmen and lawgivers that were renowned in the following centuries for their wisdom. The title of seven wise men, or seven sages, was the title given by ancient Greek tradition. Each of these sages represents a worldly aspect of wisdom, 
though each has varied over time, these are the most common, Cleobulus of Lindos, he would say that moderation is the best thing. He governed as Tyrannos of Lindos, in the Greek island of Rhodes, circa 600 BC. Solon of Athens, he said that keep everything with moderation. Solon, 640-559 BC, was a famous legislator and social reformer from Athens, enforcing the laws that shaped the Athenian democracy. Chilon of Sparta, authored the aphorism You Should Never Desire the Impossible. Chilon was a Spartan politician from the 6th century BC to whom the militarization of the Spartan society is attributed. Bias Supreme, most men are simply bad. Bias was a politician who became a famous legislator from the 6th century BC. Thales of Miletus, Thales is the first known philosopher and mathematician. He famously said know thyself, a sentence so famous it was engraved on the front facade of the Oracle of Apollo and Delphos. Pitocus of Mytilene, c. 650 BC, govern Mytilene. Lespus, along with Mercilus, he tried to reduce the power of nobility and was able to govern Mytilene with the support of popular classes, to whom he favored. He famously said you should know which opportunities to choose. Perienter of Corinth, he was the Tyrannos of Corinth circa 7th and 6th centuries BC. Under his rule, Corinth knew a golden age of unprecedented prosperity and stability. He was known for being far-sighted with everything collectively. These wise men have been quoted and mentioned throughout antiquity and have been looked to as great men worthy of emulation if and their least for their thoughts. Plato's Protagoras is the oldest and most explicit mention of the seven sages in which he says, There are some, both at present and of old, who recognize that Spartanizing is much more a love of wisdom than a love of physical exercise, knowing that the ability to utter such brief and terse remarks belongs to a perfectly educated man. Among these were Thales of Miletus and Pitocus of Mytilene, and Bias Supreme, and our own Solon, and Cleobulus of Lindus, and Mycen of Chen, and the seventh of them was said to be Chilon of Sparta. They all emulated and admired and were students of Spartan education, and one could tell their wisdom was of this sort by the brief but memorable remarks they each uttered when they met and jointly dedicated the first fruits of their wisdom to Apollo in the shrine at Delphi, writing what is on every man's lips, Know thyself and nothing too much. Why do I say this? Because this was the manner of philosophy among the ancients, a kind of laconic brevity. 7. The seven planets from classical astronomy included the Sun and Moon and the five non-Earth planets of our solar system closest to the Sun each visible without a telescope including Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. At an early point they were considered a stairs planetai or wandering stars, as they were seen as non-fixed objects in the night sky. The astute observer may notice the inclusion of the sun and the moon as these two objects relate to the leadership of the Lodge, the pillars of wisdom, strength, and beauty, and the art of Kabbalah. As a side note, the early seven planets were the derivatives of the names of the weak. In alchemy the seven metals of the classical world, gold, silver, mercury, copper, iron, tin, and lead which corresponded to the known planets. How do we relate these sevens to the degree is complex. Perhaps how Serlet stated, each of these sevens are elements of perfection, how to achieve perfection, how to live it, how to incorporate it, etc., giving us the map by which to seek it out. With this, we have reached the top of the stair, and in having taken the journey we have learned what we can about the being of a fellow of the craft. As said earlier, this is a complex lot of knowledge and information to digest through the smallest of apertures as presented on a rolled out carpet is given in the degree lesson. It is assumed that the candidate would have knowledge of these esoteric things. In the sense that few would have studied them and even fewer committed them to memory, or that the candidate would seek out this information beyond their degree explanation to educate and enlighten himself as to what these various elements mean. This lesson in three parts is an offering of the latter in assumption that you like the author, are in deficit of the former and not enlightened in the ways, means, and ideas of the deep and often obtuse ancient world that is so little a part of our modern one. Clearly, the second degree is a wealth of information, from the suggestion of the pillars of wisdom, strength, and beauty as a conduit to the study of the Kabbalah, to the understanding of our senses and their physical and spiritual meaning and to the study of alchemy in its assertion of the significance of the seven planets and what we can infer from them physically as their position in the heavens affects our life. Perhaps Thales of Miletus said it best saying know thyself as this change is the fuel to discovering the universe, 
both within and without. There is much more to this statement than what rests at its surface, of both the degree and of our being and, it is with some hope that this has served to educate you to that end. The Empress. It is a time to create. Your environment offer you the abundance you need to feel nurtured and comfortable so that you can manifest your vision in the world. Inspiration is all around you. Be sure to nourish yourself with whole foods. Indulge all of your senses. Connect with nature by working in a garden or deeply inhaling the scent of trees and flowers. Connecting with creative, empowered people will enchant your creative spirit. It is time to celebrate your fertile, sensual, Create self.